pollination. Uh, we'll do those in three seg segments. And uh, if you have questions, we'll stop at the end of each uh, briefly for questions. Um, ultimately, the goal, at least for most people, is to get to, to this point. Uh, not the raggedy pants, but uh, uh, the, the nice uh, fruit that we have here. These are uh, two uh, pawpaws that uh, came from the backyard here. They were about a pound each, and uh, not all of them are that big. Some are even bigger, but uh, that's uh, the goal that we're looking for. Uh, now, <clears throat> this uh, next uh, slide here gives you an idea, just briefly, I wanted to say just a few things in general about pawpaws before we get into seed germination. Uh, this is the, the distribution, the native distribution of the pawpaw. Uh, you can see it's just a, the eastern range is just about into New Jersey. In fact, there are some reports that uh, along the Delaware, particularly, there are some uh, natural stands of uh, or native stands of pawpaw. The northern range goes into Ontario, so it is a very hard, cold hardy plant, uh, good for down to uh, zone five. Going west uh, extends into Kansas and uh, the southern uh, uh, extreme is, uh, or the southern border is uh, down into Louisiana, Alabama, Georgia, and South Carolina. Uh, they will grow uh, further south, uh, particularly in, in the Florida and, and also into Texas, but they're not native there. Um, As far as the uh, history, the native history of uh, the pawpaw fruit, um, it's well, well known that the, the Native Americans, uh, prior to uh, our invasion uh, of their territory, uh, utilized uh, the pawpaw. Uh, I'm sure they uh, did a certain amount of uh, selective breeding. They didn't necessarily call it selective breeding, but that's what it was. Uh, early settlers used the, the pawpaw as a food source. Uh, our earlier presidents, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and so on, utilized them and uh, enjoyed the, the uh, pawpaw. Certainly the slaves uh, in the South used uh, uh, or utilized the pawpaw as a supplementary food. And that's well documented that Lewis and Clark on their trip back to St. Louis from their expedition, uh, forage for pawpaws amongst other things as they were basically out of fruit. I, I'm sorry, out of food. Uh, the history uh, of the cultivated uh, um, pawpaws pretty much begins in the early 1900s when the Journal of Heredity put out a, uh, uh, a uh, request for and established a pawpaw contest uh, looking for the largest and the best pawpaws. And they got a lot of response from this. Of course, their goal for this was to kickstart, get a good, good genetics, good sampling of genetics and kickstart a commercial um, production of pawpaws. Unfortunately, that really didn't develop. Uh, but uh, uh, what did develop was pretty much kind of lost up until uh, 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 along came Neil, Neil Peterson in the uh, 1970s. And uh, he planted, uh, collected a lot of information, did a lot of library work, a lot of scouting around. And uh, from the uh, seeds that he uh, came up with, he grew hundreds and hundreds of trees, studied them for several years, sampling the fruit, taking notes. Uh, really doing a pretty good uh, scientific uh, treatment of them. And ultimately he has selected seven cultivars out of the several hundred trees that he had, um, which he now has uh, the rights to, uh, they're trademarked and, and registered. Um, some of you are familiar with, with his trees. Some of you probably own some of his trees. Uh, in the 1900, uh, 1990s, Kentucky State, established a uh, pawpaw research program at uh, their field station in, in Frankfort, Kentucky. Um, they are the only 
a full-time research program in this country and still exist. It was and it still exists. And uh, uh, <clears throat> they're, they're doing, continually doing uh, uh, a lot of research and their, their research now is geared, again, being geared towards uh, commercializing um, the pawpaw. Uh, in year 2000, uh, Dr. Ron Powell established the Ohio Pawpaw Growers Association, which has since morphed into the, uh, uh, inter, uh, the, the North American Pawpaw Growers Association. And let me mention also in the year 2000, the Ohio Pawpaw Festival is established. It still goes on every September in Southeastern Ohio. And uh, it's a great festival. It's about a six or seven hour drive from here in, uh, in New Jersey. And uh, if you want something to do for a nice weekend, go out there, you can camp out at the lake where the festival is being held. And uh, it's a good time, a lot of music, a lot of good information on pawpaws, a lot of food, and uh, also uh, a lot of beer, particularly pawpaw beer. Um, Pawpaw beer, Paw Pawpaw beer, yes. <laughs> okay. uh, you can't, I've tried to buy it in New Jersey, I can't find it, but you go out uh, into Ohio, uh, Kentucky, uh, all the, all several microbrewers out there pr produce it. I actually had an inquiry uh, there a couple years ago of a local brewer, uh, brewery here in South Jersey looking to buy fruit uh, to do it. Uh, the only problem was he wanted 500 pounds of fruit to start and I didn't have 500 pounds. Uh, okay, uh, to kind of summarize pawpaws, how to grow them, it's easy. Uh, soil, you need a pH of six to seven, and they will grow in less than six, and a little more than seven. They'll grow in full sun, partial shade, or full shade. Uh, the, the key is the, the, the more sun you get, the more fruit you get. Uh, you plant them eight to 10 feet apart is recommended. You can, if you're short of space, you can grow them closer than eight. I uh, wouldn't recommend much more than 10 because it then becomes a pollinating problem. Uh, they don't require much pruning unless you wanna prune them to keep them a certain size or shape, which is actually what they do in the commercial orchards is they tend to top them so that they're shorter and uh, makes it easier to harvest the fruit. And uh, a big thing, uh, that I think is that they have very, very few natural pests. I don't have any problem with them here. Uh, no sprays involved, no treatments at all, and they're ideal for organic production. Do you oh. need to fertilize them, Charlie? I'm sorry? Do you need to fertilize them at all? Or uh, I use, the only thing I use is a uh, uh, little horse manure around them. Okay. Compost and horse manure. Uh, that's, that's all, that's really all that's required. Um, now let's talk a little bit about seed germination. If we think, talk about seed germination, let's think a little bit about, uh, germination, uh, in general and, uh, particularly how, uh, pawpaw would in nature, uh, reproduce by seed germination. Uh, well, the seeds, first of all, the seeds, as many of you know, are produced in the fall when the fruit ripens. And what would normally happen is the fruit would be either ingest ingested by uh, an animal, such as a raccoon or a possum, and the seeds uh, ex uh, eliminated with the feces. And uh, some of them may, by chance, uh, hit the right environment. And, uh, and germinate. Uh, likewise, the fruit may just rot on the ground and uh, the seeds uh, may by chance germinate. Okay, what, re what are the requirements to <clears throat> get them to germinate in nature? Is it, first of all, they have to be kept cold, which is no problem in the winter, but you don't, they, if they freeze too much uh, of a freeze, it can kill the embryos. So they have to be kind of uh, find their way into enough litter uh, in the forest floor uh, so that they get cold, they're kept moist, but not uh, frozen uh, to any long extent of time. 
And then what happens in the spring, when the soils warms up, they start to germinate. Now, uh, <clears throat> as you know, if, if we use a bean, for example, a bean, uh, if you plant it, <clears throat> excuse me, if you plant it, it will come up in a few days and in the warm soil, a week or less. A pollen seed, uh, I'm sorry, a, a pawpaw seed planted in nature uh, <clears throat> or indoor, uh, in a greenhouse takes several weeks to germinate. Uh, in fact, in nature, it won't start to germinate until, uh, when I say germinate, meaning starting to grow, it won't germinate until, uh, start to germinate until uh, probably uh, uh, May, April or May, and it takes several weeks before uh, much of anything will happen. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Uh, in this series of, uh, of pictures here, uh, you see the progression of the seed germination. This is all below ground now. And uh, in nature, this will take uh, on uh, several, several weeks into months before uh, you see anything above ground. In this series here, there's still nothing above ground. But you do see a root here that's six inches long uh, and still growing. Uh, the white part above here where the pointer is, is the beginning the growth of the stem. And you can see the stem is still connected to the seed. Here again, rem rem remembering this is all below soil level. So this is, uh, at this point here, we're talking probably about July in, in nature. Eventually what will happen, well, uh, well let, me, let me say, uh, the reason this is connected is because inside the seed are two storage organs called cotyledons. And these uh, uh, contain a lot of starch, a certain amount of uh, protein. And this is basically what feeds this whole structure that has grown so far, this, this long root the beginning of the stem and there's still a little connection here eventually what happens is here again we're talking about probably july maybe even into august what happens is that uh that connection let me back up this connection here between the seed and the shoot will eventually break and the shoot will pop up above soil level and that it's the first you'll see of this seed germinating. And again, if we do this in nature uh, or normal environment, uh, uh, this won't occur until July or August. Uh, and here we can see these in pots. Uh, <clears throat> this is the root and this is the hook and uh, the, the beginning of the stem and in this middle one here, you see what has happened after it comes up above soil level. Notice right at the tip, that's the first leaf. Uh, and uh, very, very tiny and uh, it doesn't look like much of anything and it will continue to, uh, to grow. But <clears throat> here again, we're talking about August, uh, if we're doing this in uh, out in the wild or in, in nature. And uh, eventually what happens uh, is we get uh, <clears throat> uh, a very small plant at the end of one year. Now that's not, that doesn't work very well for me, uh, for anyone who's growing uh, pawpaws. So what we do is we cut out nature and we artificially um, grow these seeds or plant them and keep them warm indoors. And uh, uh, we kind of cut out uh, or get two years growth in one. Uh, again, let me emphasize the seeds have to be cold, moist, stratified. I'm not sure I mentioned that before, but 
they, the seeds have to be kept cold and moist once they're collected in the fall. Uh, and you do that by placing them in a, in a, in a bag, put them in the refrigerator, not in the freezer, in the refrigerator, and uh, they can be kept there literally for uh, two or three years. But ideally, uh, we don't wanna wait two or three years, we wanna plant them as soon as possible. We kind of determined that three months is the very minimum time that they need to be cold, moist, stratified. Uh, <clears throat> four months is probably better. Five months might even be better than that. But four months brings us to about the first of January. And then, <coughs> and at four months or beginning of January, I take some of the seeds out of the refrigerator. I put them in uh, large pots. Um, these are like, uh, I guess, 10 inch pots. And uh, we put maybe 50 or so seeds in a pot, cover it with an inch or two of moist soil and put a newspaper over the top and set them right next to the baseboard heater in the house and let them set there for about uh, 45 or 50 days. After four or five, 45 or 50 days, we take the pot out um, to the uh, potting table and dump it out and uh, see what we have. And here's a little uh, demo of how we do that. Uh, we'll just let this play. Sorry about that. Can't get the, what am I doing wrong, Nagisa? Maybe turn the uh, laser pointer off. Oh, I gotta turn the pointer off, okay. Yep. Thanks. Question about seed germination and the system of seed germination that I use. Uh, you notice we have the mystery pot here in front of me. Uh, what this represents and what it is, is a pot of soil that seeds were planted in January 1st. Uh, about the middle of February, I dumped this pot out and took out the seedlings that had, or seeds that had sprouted and I put every, the ones that hadn't back in the pot. So now, um, we're, I've just now taken this away from the heater I have in the house. This sits in the house and next to the baseboard heat on a, on a piece of styrofoam. And uh, so here we are out from January 1 to now towards the end of um, April. What I do, very simple, take this and dump it out and hope there's something there. Where are they? Oh, here we are. Now you see, here's a seedling or a seed that has sprouted. Another seed that sprouted. Um, there's probably more in there. Here's, no, that's not one. Here's another one here. Okay. Uh, now, what I do with these, and I'll show you very quickly, just do one. And, uh, two and a half by 10 inch pot. Uh, it's moist, the soil in here, the mixture is moist. I take a seedling or a sprouted seed, and I, I don't know where you can see into that. I stick that right down in the hole that I prepared and a little soil over it, just a little bit, and we have it. Now, so that's one, and I will do the rest of them. I will not do it right now. So we'll just cover those up to keep them moist until after I'm done doing the photography here and I can do it my leisure plant those. Now, let me show you what came from this pot earlier this year. As I said, I started these the 1st of January, the middle of February, I dumped them out and took these sprouted ones out, just like I've shown you. And now here we have a flat that 
has seedlings that are come up and uh, most of them have already come through the ground. A few have not. So you get a variety, a variation as to how much growth you get. This is uh, after about uh, uh, two months of being in these pots after I took them out of here. So we're from January 1 to the middle of April here. Let me show you what I hope to have after a year. This is a, this is a seedling, one of the bigger ones, one year later. See that, Catherine? Okay. And I will show you this one also. This is the same age, except I had it in the greenhouse for the last six weeks. And you can see it's budded out and the stems have actually elongated about six inches or so. Okay, now this all seems very simple, and it is. It doesn't take a genius to figure out how to do this. But let me show you if you, with the, this is what I call my two year and one system. Planting in January, heating them, keeping them warm, and getting good growth that first year. If you were to take the same seeds and just plant them outdoors, uh, this is about the best you can hope to get after going into the next spring. The reason for that is that the pawpaw seed doesn't, ger takes, doesn't germinate until it's warm, you plant it in the soil, it takes two to three months for to, you to get any growth. So you usually won't see anything above soil level until uh, July or even into August. And then what you end up with are uh, plants that may be six inches long. I've seen some of them are just barely break through the ground and that's it. So I'm going from potentially that to this in one year, whereas this would take two years to get to this stage. Okay, that's just another view of what I showed you in the uh, video. And here again are seedlings after the, in the fall, of the uh, ones that we started in January. Uh, this last slide of this section, I just wanted to show you what the roots look like in these pots. Uh, the ones here on the left are uh, uh, out of the uh, 10 inch pots. You can see them large, at the end of the summer, these large amounts of roots that you have here. This is what we use to then graft onto. And when we graft the following spring and then transfer, uh, transplant these into the 14 inch pots uh, and grow those uh, through the summer to produce a uh, transplantable tree. Uh, the roots here on the right uh, or the, the, the shows you uh, the amount of roots that you have in, in those pots. So it's, it's a really a big root producing plant that first year or two of growth. That's the main, uh, the main thing that the tree does. But um, okay, so we have any questions on uh, this segment? Okay, guys, I'm gonna unmute all of you so that you can ask questions if you have any questions. I've gone ahead and done that. Does anyone have any questions on the first section? Yes, but I ask a quick question. Sure. Um, what's the level of moisture when you when you get the seedlings from you're closing them to heat? Like, do you water them at a regular interval, or just it's in the soil, or how do you maintain moisture? You kind of broke up on your question. I didn't catch it. Oh, I'm sorry. The, I was asking about the moisture level when you when you're sprouting the seedlings, like with the soil that it's in. Just moist. Okay. Not not soaking wet. You don't want it soaking wet. Usually, when I when I sprout those in January, I'll soak that that uh, soil real well. I plant them and then uh, 
might not have to water them maybe one time in the next six weeks. That's all. Thank you. I have a question. Um, we're looking at the uh, rooted uh, 10 inch um, root mass, and you said this is what you use to graft. So I'm, I'm guessing that you have uh, one set of seeds that are vigorous rootstock and one set of seeds that are, um, I guess, managed for high fruit quality, and that's what you're grafting together. So you have two different rooting processes going along? Uh, not really. Uh, any, any, I use any of the seeds for, for graft, to grow grafting mater uh, materials to be grafted on, in other words, root stocks, uh, nothing particular. Uh, there's been a, a little bit of a, st uh, uh, one study, I think that Kentucky State did attempting to determine if there was any one particular cultivar that, that made better root stocks. And I think the conclusion they had was, a pretty significant difference. Uh, most, most any of them uh, will uh, serve as a rootstock. Uh, as of course, the uh, and we'll get into this when we talk about grafting. The uh, the scions that you use are particular particular cultivars. May I say something real quick? Sure. Hi, I'm Susan Owen, and I have the Lily Patch Farm here in the mountains. <coughs> And I use, for rootstock, I use my native trees, seeds from our native trees that are right around here um, because I feel like they get better rootstock because they're native here. And then I will graft selected cultivars onto the rootstock of the native trees. Does that make sense? Uh, probably does. I don't have any natives here, so. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, I've heard I've heard that before that people uh, will uh, tend to use the native. Uh, I don't know that there's ever been any studies done uh -huh. to show that that really is uh, the case. But uh, certainly, it certainly, it kind of makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense to me to use the native trees there right around here because we're in sort of a weird little uh, different climate because we're like 3,300 feet in the air and we're like zone 5b right and so, where, where, where are you where are you located by the way right outside of boone north carolina up in the northwest oh, mountain, yeah. Yeah. appalachian mountains of north carolina that's uh uh yes I've been, I've been i know right where it is in fact i've stayed in boone before we've been down to uh, merle fest before yes yes yeah. well um i've got a seedling production Paul seedling production and right now I've got about 400 trees in tree pots. I've got 60 trees in an orchard. So yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, good, good. Great. Um, Charlie, somebody's asking, um, I think it's Frank, he's asking is it wise to put the seedling in the ground in the first year? You can, it's no problem. They're, they're, they're quite hardy, particularly around New Jersey. I don't know if you're in Maybe in a zone five, you, whether uh, that would be a, would really affect them, but uh, certainly certainly in a, a zone six, uh, there's no problem with those seedlings. I, I've planted them out when they're year old in the fall. Okay, shall we move on? Yeah, I think you should go ahead. I'm going to mute everybody, so hang on a second. Are we good to go? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I just want to say if, uh, a little bit about grafting. Uh, to start grafting, uh, start talking about grafting, uh, uh, some of the reasons why would we graft. Uh, the main reason, particularly as far as pawpaws are concerned, is we want to clone the parent. Uh, the parent being, uh, for example, one of the uh, select cultivars that uh, Neil Peterson developed or some of the, the cultivars that Kentucky State have developed or some of the older what I refer to as heirloom uh, vari uh, uh, varieties or cultivars. Uh, so we want to clone the parent. Uh, 
There's also uh, sometimes a reason for grafting is to increase vigor. I don't think this really uh, has, uh, applies to pawpaws. Uh, increased disease resistance probably doesn't apply to pawpaws, although it does to certain other fruit trees. Uh, as far as producing dwar the dwarfing effect, uh, many of your fruit trees, uh, such as apples and, and peaches and pears and so forth, uh, you can get dwarf ones because of the grafting. I think with pawpaws, there may be a, a certain amount of dwarfing that occurs uh, if one just compares uh, cultivars uh, as compared to seedlings that are grown, uh, but it's, it's pretty minimal. And uh, another thing that uh, you can use graft to do is to improve or rejuvenate older trees. Uh, that's kind of a special technique. Uh, I know at Kentucky State right now, they're doing a certain amount of that with uh, some of their older trees. Uh, now, a graft, very basically, uh, a graft is made up of two components. It actually can be three components, but usually uh, it's two components. One is the rootstock and one is what is called the scion. Uh, <clears throat> the rootstock is which as the name indicates, that's the part in the ground with the stem coming up and the sign is what you're adding to it. It's the cultivar uh, or the uh, particular, uh, yes, cultivar that you want. Now, uh, I have a video uh, of uh, doing uh, how I graft. It's kind of unorthodox. I, I do kind of a, uh, what you might call a, a modified bench technique. Uh, I you utilize the, uh, the seedlings that I have in those 10-inch uh, uh, mini tree trainer pots. And I just put them out on a table. I don't take them out of the pots. I leave them in the pot. And, uh, and I use uh, <clears throat> an unsophisticated knife uh, uh, in which I can change the blades. I don't have a fancy grafting knife. And, uh, but in any case, uh, it works for me. I don't have, I don't, I have to tape up my hands and my thumbs and so forth, as some people do when they're grafting and doing it all up in their, in their hands. I, I lay the tree out on the, uh, on the uh, <clears throat> table on this block of wood and, and make my cuts there. And so we'll show you that and uh, here we go. I trouble again. What I will do is cut at the bottom on an angle. Hopefully I get it right the first time. Cut about like so, and that looks pretty good. The second thing we do is about a third of the way down on the cut, one goes in and as you go in, you want to kind of curve it back slightly towards the center of the stem. Otherwise, you tend to cut clear through or peel it back. You don't want to peel it back, but you just want it open like, like that. Okay. Then we'll take off of that two buds. You can do one, you can do two, or you can do more. I've kind of found that two is the optimum number. If you only do one, then you only have one shot uh, of a bud breaking, uh, breaking out and, and uh, starting to grow. Now, what we want to do is, this is the rootstock, nice little rootstock. We're going to cut the top off of it, like so. And the other thing you can do with while you're doing this with the um, cyan that's ready to go, you just put it in your mouth. Saliva will not hurt it. In fact, it keeps it moist. Then you want to try to just size up about where on the rootstock axis will match <coughs> the diameter of the cyan. And I think right about here looks pretty good. We'll go in and we'll try to make an identical cut. What I got actually that 
it's a little bit large there. We're going to move down the axis a little bit, which is quite fun. Okay to do. We want a little steeper angle. About like that. That looks better. Looks like those two should match up. Good. Now you do the same cut about a third of the way down. Again, curving back towards the center just a little. And then you just, and I need my glasses to do this. Then you just slide the two together. Make sure you line up the two sides. And that looks like a pretty good match. If anything, the rootstock is slightly small, but it should be fine. Just nestle them together. Can you see that close up of that? Okay, now. Uh, and also with that, you get an idea of how these two fit together, almost like a two fingers on the other opposite hand intermeshing. Then you, the next thing is to take some parafilm, stretch it a little bit, start at the bottom and twirl it around, kind of press tight because you want those two flaps to be as close a contact as you can. There we have a pretty good, what looks like should be a pretty good graft. You can see we have one bud here. We have another bud down here. Uh, ideally, uh, we would have sign wood with larger buds, but these will be fine. Final thing to do actually is to take some hot melted wax. This is para paraffin wax or actually grafting wax, which is a little different melting point than paraffin wax. Cover the tip, cover the graft area. If you get some of it on the bud, that's fine. The bud will break right out through that. I know some, some people will coat the whole thing with wax. I don't necessarily do that. One final thing you do is take the Put a label on it. Unless you're only doing one variety, then I guess it doesn't make a heck of a lot of difference. But it's still good to label it. I want. Okay. Um, this next slide shows a uh, close up of that whip and tongue graph. I don't know what I mentioned that before, but it's whip and tongue graph. Uh, and you can see uh, the split, the slice, the split, and uh, how they how they fit together. This one this fits real nice. The important thing about this graft or any graft is that you line up the cambium tissues uh, along the edges. In other words, if the edges are lined up, then the growing part, which are the uh, vascular cambium, they will be uh, lined up next to each other. This is where the cell division occurs and where uh, uh, hopefully the, uh, the two halves will knit together and uh, continue to grow. And here's another view over here of the uh, uh, graph that's, that's wrapped up. Um, and if you're lucky, uh, a month or Six weeks later, you have grafted trees that look something like this. And uh, these are two young ones that are coming along real nice. I have another quick video here showing another type of grafting. Uh, as I said, the one we did before is referred to as whip and tongue. Uh, another t form, a common um, means of grafting is uh, what's called cleft grafting. And uh, I'll just show you how that works. Uh, it's, uh, I know some people use it. Uh, 
uh, quite regularly. It can be done with uh, cyan and rootstocks that are identical in size, or, and it can also be done used if uh, if the graft is uh, uh, if the uh, <coughs> if the two components are not of the same size. So let's just do that very quickly. Cleft grafting is uh, something that's oftentimes used in the field, can be done uh, particularly with uh, older trees as well as uh, young trees. I'm going to do this with just a young tree here. So we'll clip off the, first we want to show you that the diameters are about the same size and where, what we want to do is try to select a, a spot where they're ideally the same diameter. So we'll clip off the top, kind of get rid of that, and uh, I think uh, we want to probably come down about where my finger is, and that um, horizontally. Cleft graft, unlike, unlike the um, whip and tongue that I showed you before, with the, with the um, Rootstock, we want to try to split the rootstock right down the center. Yep, and up nice and close. Down about, oh, depending on this, the diameter, maybe as much as an inch or a little more. And then with the cyan, we'll take a piece of cyan here. Again, I want to select it with the same diameter if possible. And that looks like uh, maybe right about here, cut that, and instead of splitting this, we want to start about an inch or three quarters of an inch up and cut it down. What we want to end up with is a wedge, and we do that on each side. It's not quite enough, so we'll do some more, whittle it a little more. Ideally, we end up with just a point. I can point out that the green areas here that's the active growing area and that's what you need to line up with the green on the rootstock let me just get this a nice point at the end there we go and then what we do well first i want to eliminate part of this we only want two buds so we'll cut that there and then we just insert that in like that and if you look closely at that, that looks actually pretty good. Fits nice. Uh, you, hopefully you don't have air spaces in there. And hopefully the, the two green areas, which are the cambiums, line up. Okay. Um, if you're in a situation where the sizes aren't the same size, and I'm a little bit off on size here. If you look at this size, it matches real nice. The other side, it's a little bit undersized. Uh, that's okay. But you got to make sure you lace line up one side with the uh, green or cambium areas um, lined up. Okay, then, then the rest of it is just like the last video. We'll wrap it with parafilm. We'll wax it and we'll put a label on it and we're done. Okay, sorry about that. Um, the last type of, of graft I want to just mention, I, I'm I don't use this very much, but uh, a lot of a lot of trees are grafted this way. It's referred to as a chip bud graft. What this, how this works is it instead of grafting the using the the whole cyan stick, you just take a bud, cut a bud out with a kind of little 
chip as it, uh, of the bud and uh, from the cyan and then that is placed into a chipped out spot on the rootstock and uh, again then wrapped and waxed and uh, and the difference here is that the rootstock you don't cut the top of the rootstock off you let it continue to grow and then once the chip bud buds out and grows for uh, a few weeks then you then you remove the top of the rootstock and you now have a grafted uh, cultivar of uh, that you wanted so that's that's another type of grafting that uh, uh, some people use uh, I know they've tried that uh, at Kentucky State with uh, with the pawpaws and I think they've kind of found that they are not as successful with chip budding as uh, they do with uh, whip and tongue or or cleft grafting. Uh, okay, are, are there any questions on? Uh... Yeah, Charlie, there were two questions. Okay. One is um, that somebody was asking, uh, going back, if, if you're planting a small seedling, how do you protect it from deer? <laughs> Put a fence around it. <laughs> That's what I said, but I was hoping you might have something more. No. <laughs> no. no, if anybody who's been out here at the farm in Branchburg know virtually, well, my trees in the backyard are, uh, they're all, the whole area is fenced in, but any of the trees in the other part of the farm, uh, they're all individually have uh, uh, a fence around them. Uh, I, you know, that's, it. The deer, the deer don't like pawpaws, but they will mess with them, and they'll nibble on them, particularly early in the year, like now, when the buds start to break and you get a little bit of new growth, they will, they will nibble on them, and it, it really, uh, particularly for a younger tree, it, if they take the top out of it, you basically lose a year. All right. Well, I said maybe they could use a stake with fishing line around it, you know. Uh, that might work. That might work. I've not tried it. I've, I happen to have fencing and uh, I just use fence. All right. Sorry, Brett. <laughs> okay. So then the next question was, um, Jeanette asked if you could review the timeline, September to January, cool and moist in the fridge. And then January to February, you said 10 inch pot. Uh, oh, for the seed germination? Yeah. Well, just the whole process. Yeah. Okay, that's, yes, I can do that. The timeline is this. September, you collect the seeds. Clean them thoroughly. I don't know, maybe I didn't mention that, but you got to clean the seeds, get all the flesh off of them, uh, put them in a, uh, I use a paper bag, uh, I'm sorry, a plastic bag. Uh, you can either store them without any medium in it, or pro what's probably better is to use some sphagnum or peat moss. Uh, this tends to uh, keep the moisture in. That, that should be moist, and the seeds are kept moist during this whole procedure. And uh, you, you do that in September or beginning of October with your collected clean seeds. Put them in a refrigerator, and uh, I leave them there till at least the 1st of January. Uh, at that point, uh, you can start to germinate them by taking them out, planting them into uh, pots or individually, but plant, I plant them because I don't have room to have uh, several hundred uh, small pots around. So I plant, as I showed you, uh, lots of them in one big, bigger pot and then collect the germinated ones. But in any case, you plant in January uh, and uh, you'll start to get seed germination or sprouting in uh, February into March into April and those uh, you can, uh, if you're doing them in mass, you can uh, uh, plant those individually into those uh, uh, four and a, uh, two and a half by 10 inch uh, tree trainer pots is what I use or anything. The key is you want something that's uh, fairly deep so that those roots will grow and not be stunted. If you plant them in uh, shallow round pots then they grow right down to the bottom and uh, uh, stunts the root or they'll grow, start growing in circles. Uh, <clears throat> okay, as far as the timeline is concerned, it'll be uh, 
uh, for the one started in January, uh, the first thing you'll see above ground will probably be uh, uh, late March, uh, middle of March, late March into April at the earliest, and then uh, just grow them. Uh, uh, I grow them in a greenhouse up until about the 1st of May, and then we put them out in the nursery, and they grow the rest of the uh, summer there with uh, in a uh, controlled water, watering system. And uh, we have, uh, you know, two foot tall or better trees uh, by uh, September. Great. Did that answer your question? Uh, Jeanette? You all set there? Um, and then, yeah, I think that we're, we're good. She says yes. Okay. So then the last question I have here is, can you graft onto rootstock that has already started to leaf out a bit? Or should the rootstock still just have tiny buds? Oh, I didn't, you know, I'm sorry, I didn't mention that. I, I like the rootstocks to be out uh, in, uh, with at least some leaves on them, or at least half size leaves. Uh, you, but you can graft on uh, in the middle of summer. I know uh, a lot of guy, a lot of people, uh, Ron Powell, for example, they'll run uh, a grafting workshop out in Ohio, uh, I think in the middle of May or late May. And so they're using rootstocks that are out in full leaf, probably had leaves on them for a month or more. So no, you can use uh, any, any uh, rootstock. You don't want to do it on a dormant rootstock. Uh, you do want at least uh, some leaves uh, have, uh, some buds have bro broken and, and there are some leaves developing. Great. And then Jeanette had a, a follow on question about grafting. Why do you cut the entire top off the scion? Uh, off the scion? Well, you don't have to. If you use it, you can use the tip uh, part. The, pro the problem is usually the tip is pretty small. Uh, but if you have a real small rootstock, yes, you can use the tip. And in which case you leave, uh, you have the terminal bud and you have probably at least two more buds uh, there. But uh, if you, uh, Go down that rootstock, or go down the cyan stick, which uh, might have maybe a dozen buds on it, up to a dozen, maybe not quite that many, but several buds. Uh, I think if you if you leave if if you leave too many buds, it's just too it's overwhelming uh, to get the thing to to grow. So that's why we like to eliminate it down to where we have only uh, two two buds um, on the cyan. Uh, but again, if you if if it's a t if it's a tip and it's a small rootstock, uh, you can use the tips. I I regularly use those, and they I can't see much difference between the tips starting to to take as opposed to a a, a lateral bud further down uh, the uh, cyan stick that's utilized. Okay, great. Okay, so folks, I've unmuted everybody to make sure there are no other questions. Anybody have any? Other questions before we move on to the next section? I have a quick question. Okay. Um, so the cyan wood that you were just talking about that could possibly have up to 12 buds on it, you could cut that cyan wood into sections with two buds a piece. Correct. You, okay. I just wanted to make sure that was clear. Okay. okay. Good. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I routine, you. Routinely, if you got a you know, if you've got a good cyan stick that has several buds, several nice buds on it, you, you want to, <clears throat> you'll get, you know, maybe three or four different graphs or even more than that off of one stick. Okay. Uh, one other thing, uh, <clears throat> you find a lot of times on cyan that has been, cyan wood that has been collected will have flower buds on it also. You want to remove the flower buds. Uh, and I prefer not to use that part of the cyan if I can, if I don't have to, uh, because uh, even though you remove the flower bud, the, the vegetative bud is very tiny in, in at, at that particular node. So uh, uh, I, I, I feel it's best that you can just use, if you have the luxury of, of, of uh, selecting which 
which uh, scions you use. Use the ones with the big buds as opposed to the small buds. Um, Charlie, Pat from Ben Salem asks, does the root stock need to be pawpaw? Excuse me? Does the root stock need to be pawpaw? Uh, as far as pawpaws are concerned, yes. As far as I know, there's been no, uh, no experimentation using something other than a pawpaw. Uh, there, there are some, uh, some other relatives of pawpaw that grow, uh, even this, it's in the same, uh, same genus, different species, uh, that grow down uh, further south, in, uh, South Georgia, uh, South Carolina, Florida. And uh, I don't know whether, uh, they will cross pollinate, but I don't know whether they're compatible as far as rootstocks are concerned. And I've seen no reason to do that. Uh, but uh, they might be compatible. Now, there are some fruits, uh, in fact, many of the fruits, the, the uh, more common European fruits and so forth, in which the rootstock is not the same, uh, not the same species as uh, as as the cottonwood, but uh, as, far as, as far as I know, with pawpaws, that has not been done. Okay, moving on. All right, Charlie, you can go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. I lost my pointer. Okay, here we go. All right, the last uh, segment we want to talk about is uh, uh, pollination. We have to have pollination, obviously, to get to those big fruits that we saw at the beginning. Uh, now, I think uh, to really understand pollination, we need to know a little bit about the flower. And this is not, uh, this is ap ap applicable to uh, most flowers. Uh, uh, the pawpaw flower and, and most flowers have three major components. These are the sepals, petals, stamens, and the pistils. Uh, the sepals and petals, these are the pretty parts. These are the parts that really do not play directly into the uh, reproduction or uh, pollination process. Uh, the stamens uh, are sometimes referred to as the male component of the flower and the pistil uh, is the female component. Um, the next slide, here's a, here's a view of a uh, pawpaw tree, a uh, nice silhouette view uh, showing basically uh, that the flowers come out before the, in this, in the, uh, in April, uh, here in, uh, in central New Jersey in April, and you can see they're out before the leaves come out on the tree, so you, you get a good view of the flowers. On the right hand side, we have uh, a close up and you can see the flowers here. There's like two different colored flowers. Uh, there's this greenish colored flower and then there's the maroon flower. Um, what, what we have here is uh, essentially the same, the same flower, but in different stages of development. The green flower is the immature flower it's in that immature flower that the female part uh, becomes mature or ripe. I call it being ripe. It means it's ready to receive pollen. Uh, that's the pistil, uh, or particularly the uh, stigma of the pistil. Uh, in the purple stage, uh, at that point, the female part is already past its prime, it will not, it's either been pollinated or it will start to, to basically uh, wither. But the uh, male part, uh, the stamens, uh, will produce pollen at that point, at that, at that stage. Okay, if we go to, uh, uh, here you can see uh, just a little information about flowering. They occur, as I mentioned, in late April into May. Uh, <clears throat> they're pollinated by flies, beetles, ants, uh, spiders, various other types of insects, but no bees. Bees do not, 
are not attracted at all to, uh, to the pawpaw. Uh, these flies, particularly uh, beetles and so forth, uh, and, and ants uh, <clears throat> seem to uh, are att attracted to the uh, flower of the pawpaw because of the um, uh, odor that is produced. Now, it's not a it's not a a real offensive odor. In fact, I can't really smell it. Uh, I have actually had a, a person once, kind of an interesting story. She called and <laughs> said she wanted pawpaws, but she heard that they they had a a, a, a very bad odor. And she didn't want anything in her backyard that didn't smell good. So uh, I assured her that you will not smell these at a distance. If you put your nose right in the flower, you may get some detection of, of odor. And the other thing about pawpaw flowers is, or pawpaws as a species, is they have to be cross-pollinated, meaning they have to have two genetically different trees. That means that you have to have, if you're growing uh, grafted trees, you have to have two different uh, two different cultivars. Uh, if you have one, two trees of one cultivar, you are genetically have just one tree, uh, or at least one set of genetics. Uh, any two, any two seedlings will cross pollinate, and likewise, any seedling and any grafted tree will cross pollinate. Uh, now, if we look at the uh, flower on the right, or the, the flower in, in the view here, we can see a mature uh, late stage flower. Uh, you can see the sepals. They're actually, I'm sorry, uh, the petals. You do not see the sepals in this, in this view, uh, but you do see uh, uh, two whorls of petals. There are three whorls, uh, three in each whorl. And in the yellow, the green, spot in the center is the stigma of the pistil. That is what uh, would receive pollen and all the gray and, and uh, area around uh, the flower uh, are the stamens. Uh, and uh, these are producing pollen. Um, we go on. Here's a, a quick, just a uh, components of the flower pulled apart three sepals, six petals, and uh, down at the bottom on the right, uh, the <coughs> uh, male and female components, the pistil and the, uh, and the stamens. And in dissected view, or here, here we have uh, the, uh, on, the, on the left, the flower in which the sepals and petals have been removed. Uh, I want to point out here, you can see the tip of the stigma, or stick, the tip of the uh, pistol in which the, the tip is called the stigma. This is where the pollen will land. And uh, uh, what happens is uh, once the pollen lands there, and you can see it will, in this view on the right, it will actually grow a pollen tube down to where the ovary is located. It will release a nucleus, a sperm nucleus, and that will fuse with the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the, the sperm nucleus will fuse with the uh, egg nucleus and uh, that will accomplish what's called fertilization. So you have two different processes here. Pollination, that's the transfer of the pollen to the stigma and the fusion of the, uh, the egg and the nucleus and the sperm nucleus to uh, accomplish fertilization. And of course, this fertilization is what leads to the uh, production of an embryo uh, and ultimately uh, that's inside the seed and the fruit will form and so on. Now going back to the left hand side you can see the all these sacs around here. These are the anthers, uh, anthers uh, <clears throat> the anthers which produce pollen. Uh, there are hundreds of anthers in this one flower and each one is capable of producing literally hundreds of pollen grains or thousands of pollen grains. So one, one flower will produce literally uh, tens of thousands of pollen grains. Okay, now going, uh, moving on, here's the same, more or less the same picture before. And you can see uh, again, the stamens around 
here, the anthers of the stamens, I'm kind of using those terms interchangeably, they're not. The stamen is the whole male <coughs> component and the uh, anther is the tip of it that produces the pollen. Uh, but you can see all, all the pollen producing air, area around here. Now when we hand pollinate or when pollination occurs, one of these insects has to pick up pollen from this area and transfer it to another tree to uh, uh, accidentally uh, deliver the pollen to the stigma. So we have to go from this maroon flower to a green flower, immature flower, and uh, uh, land the pollen there on that sticky uh, stigma uh, where, whereby the pollen tube can grow and, and so on. Uh, now, um, I found that if just having natural pollination here in Central Jersey, I don't know why, but I don't get a whole lot of fruit. And I've heard this from other people. So <clears throat> what we do is uh, hand pollinate. Uh, now this year, I would have started hand pollinating about two weeks ago. But, and I was just ready to do that. And then we had a, a freeze. Three days, three nights, we were down below uh, uh, 30 degrees. We were actually about 27 or 8 degrees, three nights in a row. So a lot of the flowers that we had uh, <clears throat> ready, just about ready to uh, start hand pollinating, a lot of them were lost. Some of the trees I have lost uh, probably uh, uh, 95 or percent or more of the flowers. So I have a couple of videos here. Okay, here we are in the backyard of the pawpaw orchard. It's April 25th. Normally we would just about begin hand pollinating. Unfortunately, <coughs> this year flowers ripened a little bit early and the freeze was a little late and we lost a good portion of the flowers. This particular cultivar is overlease. It's appears that it's lost at least 90 or 95 percent of the flowers. Now we're going to zoom over here. This is Potomac. Potomac had a little better survival rate uh, and uh, we can see probably uh, lost only maybe uh, 70 or 80 percent of the flowers. If we get one of these flowers open that survived you can see in the center, it's ready to be pollinated. That dot in the center is the stigma of the ovary and it's receptive to pollen. The problem is there's no available pollen yet. This particular flower will probably uh, be a pollen donor in about three or four days if we get a little warmer weather. Okay, um, now the, uh, the next video shows actually how we do, I uh, took this a few days later, how we uh, do uh, hand pollinating. Um, again, uh, I was really limited on uh, the uh, number of uh, uh, flowers that we had and uh, particularly those that in which the uh, uh, <clears throat> the uh, pollen was uh, available. So let's take a look at this. Okay, here we are on Tuesday morning. Uh, we're gonna attempt to uh, hand pollinate. We had a problem, as you know, as, I, as you know, we uh, had a freeze and there are very few uh, flowers that are ready. I did find this one flower that has ripe pollen in it. Now, as you remember, uh, the pollen ripens after the female part of the flower. So I took the leisure to just remove this from the plant uh, since uh, there was no chance of this uh, ovary being uh, uh, pollinated and fertilized. Now, I'm gonna try to show you how we do this. Normally, this would be on the tree and we just take a brush and we brush 
the pollen. You see all this gray, yellowish stuff? This is the pollen. And I brush that off into a cup. I actually use a shot cup, which works very well. Um, okay, now, normally I would do this for several flowers, and then I would go to a, a more immature flower, such as this one here, which if we look at it closely, you can see right in the center, a little dot green spot. That's the stigma. And so, I don't know whether we can get all this on the video, but what I do is just take the brush, a little pollen, and lightly dab it on the stigma. The stigmas are usually sticky. They are always sticky if they're uh, receptive for pollen. That's hand pollinating. Now, I do this uh, over a period normally of two to three weeks uh, for uh, 50 or so trees. Uh, this year it's gonna be less than that because we lost the uh, first uh, half of the flowers. Um, and uh, here's one here. This one uh, will be ready to produce pollen. It's already past being ready to be pollinated. Um, Remember the female part, which is the ovary with the stigma at the end of the ovary is what ripens first and it's ready to be pollinated. This little flower here is probably just about ready, although it's, you can't really see it, but I just know this one's about ready to be fertilized, uh, uh, I'm not fertilized, but uh, pollinated at this time. Okay. Okay, let me just say a few things uh, about that. Uh, first of all, uh, one of the luxuries of, of the uh, uh, adaptive feature of the uh, pawpaw is that it flowers over a period of at least three weeks. So when you do have a, a freeze like this, uh, and you lose flowers, you, we still have more flowers. Some other fruit trees, that's not the case. Uh, a hard freeze uh, will knock, uh, I think, knocked all the peaches that we had. Uh, but uh, we will get some fruit. Uh, now, just to say a few things about fruit production with grafted trees, usually it takes after they're planted out uh, two to four years for them to start to be produce fruit. Seedlings, trees, usually it's five to seven years on the average, and uh, a good producing tree will produce uh, at least 30 pounds of fruit per year, uh, maybe more than that. Um, here's just a, a view of the uh, orchard here at home and uh, in the midsummer. And uh, I just throw this in, this is a view of uh, <clears throat> one of the orchards at Kentucky State. Uh, just point out, they maintain their trees a little differently. They've got them pruned up higher so they can maintain under them. And also, I think they've topped some of these trees to keep them a little shorter. Um, and here's what we want in the end. Nice, big fruit. So the whole process, uh, uh, that we've been talking about is ultimate, with the ultimate goal, in most cases at least, is to get uh, fruit production. Okay, any questions? I have one. Uh, this is Jeanette, and I have uh, one pawpaw tree that I <coughs> did successfully pollinate, hand pollinate last year, and was so excited when I saw the little um, little fruits start to grow. And when they got about an inch or so uh, in size, they disappeared. And I assume, because I couldn't find anything on the ground, um, that it was from a squirrel eating them or you know, some animal getting in there and eating them. Um, do you have any suggestions on how to keep wildlife from taking the fruits even before they're ripened? I 
don't have a problem with squirrels taking them. Uh, the, the fruit, once they're mature uh, in the fall, the raccoons and, uh, and possums and groundhogs will, will take them, but I've not had a problem with, with squirrels. And you say, what, this, these, these uh, fruits started to form, they're only just uh, like an inch, inch long? Yeah, they were probably, um, you know, we were watching them for a while develop, so they had to be at least, you know, maybe a couple inches big when oh, they yeah. disappeared. And there was probably about, you know, a good dozen or 15 of them in different, you know, two or three oh, yeah. each. Yeah. That's, that's, I don't know. I can't answer your question. That's really surprising, but I guess uh, something about, <clears throat> yeah. Birds don't eat them, right? There's no... I don't think a bird would take them at that stage, but I don't know. I've never had that problem. Thank you. Sorry. I have a question. Yes. Um, you mentioned that on a normal season without free, uh, freezing temperature, you hand pollinate them for two to three weeks. Yes. Do you hand pollinate a tree that you've already hand pollinated you know, the day before or the week before? Yes. Do you go back to that same tree over and over? Yes. Over and over and over. Like every day? Uh, well, I, I wouldn't say every day, but maybe every other day, sometimes every day. Uh, in, depends on the in, weather. You, you like, first of all, the hand pollinate, you kind of like a sunny, warm day, not a lot of, not a lot of wind. Mm -hmm. uh, like this past this past week, I could have been hand pollinating a little bit, but it's it was it was rainy almost every day. I tried okay. yesterday a little bit; it was rainy. Uh, so, but no, you can go over, you know, because you can go over the tree many times because, uh, uh, as I said, they, these flowers don't all ripen at once. So, mm -hmm. a, a particular tree will have uh, uh, flowers. flowers over a three or four week period of time that uh, can be hand pollinated or pollinated. And, and is it a mature flower to a, un, to a green flower on a different tree all the time, or can you do that on the same tree? Say that again, please. So do you hand pollinate taking pollen from a mature flower to a green flower on a different tree all the time? Always, always. Or do on, you? Yes. I'm, Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, yeah, let me emphasize that again. You never want to, well, you can, but it, it, you're, the, the results will be zero. If you use the pollen from the same tree on the same flowers of that tree. Okay. So, Ideally, what, what we do uh, is I'll go out, and as I said, I, I showed you a demonstration of one flower, because that's all, I, all we had uh, a few days ago. Uh, but now, now that we're getting some ripe uh, uh, flowers, I can, uh, I'll go out to, let's say, one particular variety, or one cultivar, one tree, and I'll, I'll collect the pollen from several of the flowers on that particular tree. And then I can take that pollen in that uh, shot cup, shot glass, and I can go uh, to uh, several other trees and, and, and hand pollinate. But I don't hand pollinate on the, the tree that we just took the pollen from. Gotcha. Okay, now if I wanna, I wanna hand pollinate that tree, I take another shot glass and get pollen from another tree right. and, uh, and, and do it. So it's always cross-pollination. That's the key. Okay. Yeah. Thank uh, you. I, I have a question. I, I think I've got a good way to frame it. Let's say that you have um, a Ned Peterson, Paul Paul, um, a Shenandoah left and a Susquehanna on the right, two trees. Mm -hmm. If you take the Shenandoah and pollinate the Susquehanna, Susquehanna will always have Susquehanna fruit and vice versa. If you take the Susquehanna and pollinate the Shenandoah, the Shenandoah will always have Shenandoah fruit. That's correct. Yeah, the fruit, the fruit is determined by the parent. The size okay. of the fruit and this the, is a matriarchy then. It's a matriarchy. Yeah. 
Yeah. The only, the only thing that the uh, pollen donor does is put genetics into the embryo of the uh, of the uh, uh, seed that's developing. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. I have a question. Is there any way to determine the species of your pawpaw um, when you don't know what it is? You mean the variety? What right, variety? the variety. What that I know of. Um, you, uh, actually, that's a good question because I know Kentucky State is doing some uh, genetics research on this. Uh, using different uh, samples from, from the wild, from different areas, and they're trying to come up with kind of how these different, uh, uh, the genetics of these trees from different areas, how they relate, uh, which is kind of, a, I, I, kind of an interesting study that they're doing. But uh, uh, other than that, no, I, I don't know how you would determine, determine that. I've got a quick question. Go ahead. Um, you know when you were go uh, when you were talking about <laughs> pollination and fertilization. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, and I've through the couple of, these past couple of years, I figured out that there is a difference. Just because something's pollinated doesn't mean it's fertilized. Absolutely. So when it's fertilized, it will start to make those little tiny fruits. Um, I, I'm, yeah, that look like little pencil leads almost, those little green fruits that come out from the flower. Right. They're the size of pencil lead when they're little brand new. So a couple of years ago, well, it was last year, we had what I thought was fertilization because a lot of the flowers, it's kind of like Jeanette's question. She had little, flat, uh, little fruits on there. And I did too on my, excuse me, on my trees. And then I don't know. I wasn't watching them as close. And then I went out there to look and they'd all fallen off every single one of them. Yes. What, causes, what causes that? Does that mean they weren't really fertilized and just pollinated? I don't know for sure, but that's my guess. And it happens to me too. Okay. So that uh, every, every year I'll, I'll look at the, Oh boy, I really got a lot of fruit setting on here. And then uh, what eventually happens is uh, those little, little tiny pencil like, uh, uh, drop off and that'll occur you know probably towards the end of may yeah so mm -hmm. i suspect that well, you're right. we live. these yeah. are that the uh pollination has occurred because pollination stimulates fruit production okay. fertilization is what stimulates or what what brings about seed production and uh so I think uh, what happens, I think you're right, what happens is that you're, you're dealing with a situation where pollination has occurred, but fertilization did not. Okay. I, don't, I don't have any evidence of that, but that's, that's kind of my guess. Okay. What it is. That's at least part of it. And the other part may be just that the tree is, is fruit thinning, but it's awfully early for fruit thinning to occur. Yeah. Uh, I was just thinking that might be part of the answer to Jeanette's question. About yes. how her fruit was falling it off. It could but be. She, uh, it could be. She, but she said they were a lot bigger than that. So that's why I didn't. Yeah. Okay. Some of that, but it, that that could be the situation too. Yes. Great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Other questions? Yes, I have one. Please go. Okay. Can pollen be frozen? So if I go around gathering pollen this year, use what I can, can the leftover be frozen to use next year when the uh, green flowers come out on one of the other trees? Uh, I don't know. I know. I know at room temperature, the pollen has a span of just a few hours. So whether you can freeze it and keep it, I I doubt it, but I don't know. Any other comments? I, I just want to say I was only going to watch a few, little bit of this and I haven't been able to 
get up from my chair. <laughs> <laughs> Does that mean I put you to sleep? No, 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 no. That means that means, that means I'm numb. I'm just taking this information. It's great. Thank you. Good. That's exactly um, what I needed to know. I can't wait to try. <laughs> I'm getting a paintbrush and running out there in a few minutes. Uh, same here. Small, yeah. small brush. Very small brush. Yeah. I've seen, you know, I mentioned that. I, I've seen a video. Uh, there, there's a bunch of videos if you go on to YouTube of hand polish. And I saw one guy, he had a brush. It looked like, it looked like a, almost like a painter's brush. And uh, he was dabbing these flowers around. I was like, I, I can't believe you'll have anything left because you got to be damaging the flowers by, you know, hitting them with such a big brush. So it's, it's a gentle technique. I think that works best. Hey, uh, Charlie, I got a quick question. Um, so do you want more of a pointed brush or like a flat brush to do the pollinating? Uh, kind of pointed. Okay. Is that Brian? Yeah. Yeah, I thought I'd recognize your voice, yeah. 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 Kind of a, just a small kind of, uh, you can use a, a little wider brush when you're brushing the pollen off of, uh, you know, to collect the pollen. pollen. Uh, a little okay. bigger brush is fine. But, so it's uh, a more, a, a more of a pointed brush for when you're yeah, actually trying. right because a lot of those a lot of those green flowers in that green stage they haven't opened up very much at all so you got a very small little little hole you're trying to stick the brush through right okay yeah all right cool thanks for doing this this is amazing <laughs> a professor and now I know what I did wrong last year. I was pollinating purple flowers with purple flowers. I didn't know about the pollinate the purple flowers to the green flowers. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, in fact, it, it, it's interesting, uh, you know, the more, the more I fiddle around with these, uh, I see different varieties, different cultivars, the flower structure is, it's all basically the same, but it's a little difference in, in size and the difference in how much they open up when they're ready. <clears throat> so some of them are a lot, a little, a lot more difficult to hand pollinate than, than some of the others. Um, so there, there is variation. There is definitely variation between uh, uh, the different different cultivars, as you might, as one might expect. Um, I, I have another question. I'm sorry. Sure. Um, is this true or just sort of myth? Um, hanging a fish head, hanging. <laughs> roadkill. Um, I've got a fi beautiful um, rockfish head out, sitting out there, hanging out there. Um, I'm just wondering if that... To attract flies. Yeah, of course. Um, is that, is that uh, a good uh, uh, pollination strategy? That's, that's written all over the place. And I don't know that anybody has scientifically uh, done a controlled study on that. Uh, but uh, certainly, it certainly won't help. It won't hurt. Um, I have actually uh, uh, a few years ago. I had the remains of a deer carcass here that I just left out in the in the orchard. I, I kept it all through the winter, in uh, and uh, the remains of it in the spring I just brought out. And I don't know. I mean, there were flies around it, but I don't know whether they're the right kind of flies. You see, it's not. It's not. The com I don't think the common house fly is the fly that uh, that, you're, that does the pollinating. I think it's more a little tiny fly, and um, uh, I have a feeling that the horse manure that I use around the trees probably attracts more flies than uh, okay. the type than uh, and maybe some other things. But you know, as I said, I you read this everywhere. I've seen it stated before, and uh, as I said, I don't know that anybody's really demonstrated that, that it works. I have a quick comment on that. Go ahead. Um, several years ago, well, probably, I don't know, it's been a while now, but I tried to hang uh, some, you know, pretty ripe turkey necks on my tree. Mm -hmm. Just just trying to see what would happen. And the next day it was gone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty, I was really, I was horrified. <laughs> but <laughs> but now um, we put a little pile. It's probably six inches across and maybe three inches high 
of cottonseed meal underneath each tree mm -hmm. because it's kind of a smelly substance and we think that maybe that helps bring in flies and it's not necessarily the house flies and right. i have photographed little teeny weeny flies mm -hmm. that, you know do the work on the blossoms uh i think uh i think you're probably onto something there as a matter of fact in my recollection is I I'd spoken to Cliff England and he had mentioned that also that, uh, that uh, cotton meal seal uh, cotton seed meal would, right. would attract flies so uh, yeah that's 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 a, something that's out there and okay. glad to hear that it might work well we do that I don't know if it works or not but uh -huh. you know, we like last year all of our fruit dropped off so I don't know <laughs> how many trees do you have i have four mature trees that are probably over 20 years old mm -hmm. and then i have a stair step age orchard uh 60 trees i received a grant to plant those so i have 30 trees that are probably six years old that are starting to flower and then i have 30 trees that are two, uh three years old and then we we'll put in 30 more trees next year. Mm -hmm. Were these seedlings or cultivars you put in? Both. Both? Yeah. yeah. Both. I have them all marked and some of them are different cultivars and some of them are Peterson's and some of them are just natives because the four trees that I have that are um, mature are all native trees. Uh -huh. and, um, but I just brought them out into the sun and of course planted them in the wrong space. They're on a ridge. But um they do great. They do really well. And one of them is so different than the others. I would like to try to um, keep that one separate and not clone it, but, you know, keep that as a separate native cultivar. Right. Right. Yeah. Anyway. Have you, have you done any, any grafting onto any of the native trees you have there? This, that's my project this year. I've got some scion wood from Ron Powell. Mm-hmm. Napka, and he sent me some so that's that's my this year project yeah good good i've got a question dad sure. do, do you know if anybody has grafted multiple uh, varieties onto one tree to try and improve wild pollination uh say that again please i, I say do, do you know of anybody who's grafted several different varieties onto one tree to try and decrease the, the distance, increase the proximity of different genetics to improve fly pollination? Uh, I have. <laughs> oh, you did? I have. And I've, I've done a, a few of them, but not, uh, and certainly, certainly it would be, uh, it, it'll work. Obviously it'll work. Uh, I can, I can tell you, uh, <clears throat> Another another trick that uh, uh, I know will will work, and this this is really uh, a good idea for someone who has a limited amount of space. Uh, Michael Judd down in uh, Maryland has what amounts to two trees. Actually, his father had planted years ago, uh, basically uh, only a foot or two apart. And they just oh, wow. these two trees grew just as and now at a distance look like one tree uh, and uh, that tree produces that group of two trees looking like one tree produces always produces a lot of fruit so that I don't know whether that's uh, something one and, and regularly want to recommend pollinate. but but uh, it, it works there he doesn't hand pollinate that those two trees. No, he he doesn't hand pollinate. I don't think I don't know where he hand pollinates much of anything down there. Um, but uh, no, he doesn't have to hand pollinate on that that tree at all. At a distance, this this looks like one tree growing. You got close and look, and it's got two trunks. And there are two different uh, varieties. Uh, <clears throat> One other thing that I didn't mention with grafting is that if you have native stands of trees, you can uh, go in and graft, uh, 
graft new uh, uh, cultivars onto them, new scions onto them, and basically convert your wild wild trees into uh, native trees. Uh, I know that's, that's being done, uh, I think, fairly commonly out, uh, out more in the uh, Midwest. Ohio and Kentucky, uh, at the near Midwest, not the far Midwest, but out in, in West Virginia, some of these areas where there's a lot of native stands. Here in New Jersey, we don't have the native stands, but uh, if you go out in those states, uh, they're very common trees, actually. Anything else? Okay, well, let me just wrap this up. Um, just some uh, pictures of fruits. Wow. Um, I believe uh, the picture on the left, I think uh, Sherry Crabtree at Kentucky State sent me this picture. This is uh, uh, actually Atwood fruit. The one on the right, I don't know what that is. It's huge. Uh, yeah. They're big. Yeah. And uh, I think I think that I think I took that picture, but the one on the left I know Sherry sent me from Kentucky State. Um, <clears throat> here are just some more uh, trees here, and let's end it up. And here we are in the fall. You do these trees do for those of you who may not know they get a nice fall coloration uh, in the fall. And uh, now if we were having a, a live workshop here at the farm, as we routinely do, uh, we would now go to uh, having some pawpaw ice cream, but uh, uh, we can't do that. <laughs> so the best I can show you is some of the beverages uh, that uh, <laughs> pawpaws are used to make. Here's the uh, pawpaw beer on the left by the, the Buckeye Brewery in Cleveland, and uh, they also make, uh, others make uh, wine and uh, moonshine. I guess maybe you have to go to West Virginia to get the moonshine, but. Uh, uh, somebody uh, in the chat said that there's a Doylestown Brewery that does brew it. Oh, really? Good. But nobody in New, I don't think anybody in New Jersey, and I've checked the local liquor stores around for it in the fall, and no, nobody carries it. So uh, that's basically what I have. If you have any more questions, let's, uh, we've got plenty of time here if you want to ask questions. Um, I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Um, just to clarify Justin's question about grafting, was it grafting uh, multiple cultivars into one rootstock? Yes. Is that that has has that been done? Is that what? Yes. Yeah. Basically, okay. what you basically What's... basically what you need is a rootstock. <clears throat> well, there'd be a couple ways to do it. If you use chip budding, you could on one on one single axis you could chip more than one variety onto it. Uh, the other way would be if you had a rootstock that has a branch, so if you could then. Uh, graft onto different branches. Uh, it probably would work better on a on a larger rootstock than, than what I normally have. You'd need maybe a, a two or three year old rootstock uh, which is branched and then you could uh, you could you can definitely graft uh, more than one uh, cultivar onto it. So it's like one of those um, three in one apple combo that they sell in big box stores. Yeah. Sort of. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You can Thank do you. the same thing, sure. <clears throat> yeah, or, or graft, on, graft onto a mature tree. Yeah, or or that's that's the other thing. Rejuvenating or grafting onto a uh, mature tree, you can graft uh, uh, as many cultivars onto it as you want. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all very very much for coming today. Um, Charlie, I know you don't usually um, say much about this, but you, if they want to buy trees, can they reach out to you through your website? Uh, they can. Um, the thing is, I'm basically sold out for this year. 
Okay. Wow. I have, I have wow. lots of trees for sale. <laughs> you have trees? Yes, I do, but I'm in uh, west, northwestern North Carolina, up in the mountains. Do you mail? Ship? I haven't tried that yet. Now, you know, because I bought some, I had a really bad experience buying a whole bunch of them that were dry. I'm not dry root, but you know what I'm... It was a bear root. root. Bear root. Yeah. And uh, it was a terrible experience. Yes. They were dead, and they came from a really nice nursery, supposedly. Yeah. And he said he was going to ship them in... I forgot what he what and I, oh he's gonna ship them in March and I said please do not ship them in March because they'll freeze you know here mm -hmm. and he said oh no I'm you know I'm in a colder place than you are and I said no you're not you're I mean you're north more north than I am but I'm in you know zone five and you're in zone seven so what happened was they pulled all those and waited for two months and then shipped them to me yeah so they were awful but I wouldn't be interested in shipping them unless they were in the pots you know. Well, that's what I, I ship in pots. I ship in those uh, four by 14 inch pots. It costs a little more money, but uh, you get a live tree. Yeah, mm. that's right. That's what I was thinking. And I, and I use those pots too, those tree pots. Yeah, yeah. You ship in those, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, well, I, I ship uh, U.S. Postal Service. Okay. And that's the cheapest, uh, cheapest service. And uh, I can send the... Uh, I could send two of those trees. If I were to send you two in North Carolina, it cost about uh, roughly $15 shipping. Oh, that's uh, not bad. No, not at all. And uh, you're right. With pawpaws, don't, any of you listening, don't ever buy bare root pawpaws. Yeah, from just one. Yeah, just we, we bought uh, bare root pawpaws. You did? You got lucky with them? We, we bought bare root pawpaws a few times and got about 50% success rate each time. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's about it. They just, the roots, they just don't, they don't transplant well. Right. And if they do, and if you do survive, usually they don't grow much for a year or two. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. So. When do we put our order in for next season, Dr. West? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you're uh, you're assuming I'll be here next year. We don't know. Yes. But uh, you can put an order in anytime. Uh, all, we, okay. I, all I do, is all the orders that I have now are for trees that I'm growing now, and they'll go out. At, they'll go out midsummer and in the fall, out of here. But I've sold. I've. I've, basically, I've just stopped taking orders because I think I've probably sold. I probably have taken or uh, deposits on maybe more trees than I can produce, but hopefully I'll match up. Okay. Uh, All right. I, can you can contact me anytime uh, and we can, you know. I was going to mention, um, I have purchased from Go Native Tree Farm, which is outside of Lancaster, um, but I'm not, I'm not recommending them or anything per se, but, oh. but, but the one I bought did survive, so it, it's not, and it's, that's in this area. Yeah, what, what